Hello and welcome to a new episode of Foodocracy for Her. I'm uh, Kalyan Karmakar and Foodocracy for Her is where uh, I speak to women entrepreneurs in the world of food uh, in India and bring to you their amazing and inspiring stories. And uh, while I'm based in uh, Mumbai, today I'm going to speak to you, um, speak with someone who is joining in from Bangalore or Bengaluru as it's called now, and that is Karen uh, Martins. And Karen, uh, so lovely to have you on board. And, uh, and uh, Karen's also, uh, congratulations are due because her uh, lockdown baby, House of Anglo, has also been uh, a top five nominee in the Home Chefies uh, Awards. So may, many, many congrats on uh, that. Thank you so much. So um, I was very intrigued when uh, we went through uh, Karen's, um, you know, the entry and what she's doing and her thing, which is called House of Anglo. And I'll tell you why, uh, because I have uh, grown up for a large part in uh, Calcutta. And uh, when I've been in Calcutta, then most of my schooling has been in, um, you know, schools run by the, um, you know, the Christian missionary uh, Protestant schools. And, and there were a lot of uh, um, folks from the Anglo-Indian communities who were teachers, a few classmates as well, but many of the teachers. So whatever I am today, good or bad, or maybe the good part is, uh, you know, credit to them. And um, so, um, and, and uh, you know, it, it, in, in Calcutta, there was a fair awareness of the Anglo-Indian community because of, you know, the, the British connection before that and the schools and things like that. But to think back, uh, I mean, we didn't really know much about their food because our interaction was largely limited to uh, school and classes. And uh, there are there no restaurants who were offering Anglo-Indian food. And also most people in the Anglo-Indian community um, stayed in particular parts of central Calcutta, like the Bob Barracks and Elliott Road and stuff like that, which, um, you know, we as South Calcutta people didn't really go there much. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really what happened. And, and then a few years back, um, I read uh, the book by Buck Suraya. It's a fiction book, Calcutta Science. And, and she, uh, the book is centered around an Anglo-Indian family. And uh, if I remember right, the protagonist is from Calcutta and, and his wife uh, was from uh, Bangalore. And yeah. that's when I realized that, um, you know, there was, uh, uh, you know, a, a vibrant Anglo-Indian culture and community in Bangalore as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have a representative of that today, Karen Martin. So, <laughs> so Karen, tell us, uh, tell us about uh, who are the Anglo-Indians and and um, and then maybe about the Indians of Bangalore, which it feels yours. Great. So um, the Anglo-Indians are actually a community and people that have a British father and an Indian mother, and um, they are people that have actually got accustomed to Indian roots and at the same time British roots in terms of. Um, their culinary culture and experience. So they are people that like to live life simple, be happy with what you have. And I mean, if you ask anybody, I think the Anglo-Indians are known as a community that is extremely broad-minded and we're very jolly people because life, we live every day as it is and we like to enjoy every day. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, um, the Anglo-Indian community is different uh, in, I mean, in India because we have Anglo-Indians from the north side and then we have Anglo-Indians from the south side. And um, cuisine also differs in terms of where they come from. So in Bangalore, we have Anglo-Indians from, uh, I mean, Anglo-Indians dispersed all over Bangalore. And some of them who have settled in Bangalore come from the railways and some of them come from yes. Kola. In, in the book, there was reference of a railway sort of thing, a lot of Anglo Indians being there. Yes. Some of them come from the gold mines. I mean, like my family, my uh, great grandfather was uh, in the Kola gold mines. And uh, most of my grandmother's uh, cooking and culture and things like that have that influence, though she was in Bangalore. You know, she would visit the gold mines and she would visit Kola quite often. Where is uh, that? Kola as well? Uh, that is, it's called KGF. It's within Karnataka. So within Karnataka. Okay. Yeah. Just, uh, I think, a couple of kilometers from Bangalore. 
and uh, my grandfather lived in the Anglo Indian community because uh, they have uh, a thing called the Anglo Indian colony where mm. those days all the Anglo Indians lived there and each one knows each one by surname <laughs> so i mean uh, it's a very well knitted community each one stands for each one and food i think it's different from house to house uh, what i so even within the same city so even yes. within bangalore the food between the community might differ yes it might differ because in bangalore we have people who come from the railways we have people who come from different parts like calcutta and this and that so preparations in terms of curries and flavor and spices are very different and and also uh, like uh, you, you said that it's a uh, mixed uh, english and indian parentage yes. but i'm i'm, I'm sort of guessing that um, the anglo indians today would probably be second or third generation right like say yes. people like you and so on maybe like um are, are your parents also of like british and indian or probably few generations back it's few generations back i'm fourth generation mm. yeah i'm fourth generation so, so uh, even in mumbai and uh, the thing especially among the east indian community there's a bit of mixed portuguese and um, indian descent if you yeah. if you go back a few generations yes and um, uh the so anglo it struck me a bit similar to the parsi community because i'm married to one and and okay. the, um, i mean uh, the parsi in the, in the extent that the parsis also have their colonies where they stay and uh, you know they know each other in fact my wife says that most caste parsis are related in some way or to each yes. uh, other they have their own food culture yes. and uh, and also if i remember in in calcutta in the 80s and so on there was a fair bit of emigration of the um, um uh, anglo indians with a lot of people moving on to places like australia canada um, yes. you know uk is, coming, is that still happening coming to that point uh, it has happened within my family um my grandmother's cousins had to quit india so when the quit india movement came in they went back to england and they never came back and uh i also have uh, cousins from cousins and aunties from my grandfather's side who um, went back to england because uh, the aunt was ma- my aunt was married to somebody who comes from uh, england and has thorough british blood so the entire family migrated hmm. so so when you were growing up in and, and you're in out and out bangalore girl yes. school college journalism yes. we're going to talk about that as well yes so um uh, was there a sense that uh, maybe you had two identities i'm just trying to understand that in in home and family uh, there was a certain anglo indian identity with the, which you were in and then uh, school was perhaps more cosmopolitan and you know with hindus muslims everything did did was that as a child did one sense that or as a child we tend to be more malleable i think in any case i think growing up yes i i completely agree because um at home i had one identity and in school i had another identity and um it was more to do with the fact that i came from an anglo indian family and uh, being in school the anglo indians were very less yes. i think i was i was the third anglo indian student where i studied so um i i had two identities mainly because uh, at home as an anglo indian i mean life is different you know where we're very um, joyous happy and things i mean anglo indian families in general are very open minded and are very transparent about a lot of things culture wise but being that i studied in a convent school they were very narrow minded and uh, you know how the convent schools are yeah. and being a girl that went to convent school i yeah. had to cut down on a lot of things that i knew at home when i went to school wow yeah. on the other hand the schools which i uh, went to uh, they were sort of uh, protestant missionary schools yes but they, but they were not very overtly uh, convent or missionary so mm. i think the, but also there i think there were more uh, anglo indian teachers than students classmates i must say that i mean they were more uh, you know uh, but the anglo indian community has been uh, really big in education right i mean the icsc isc board yes. have been like anglo indian then the educationists like frank anthony and so on yes. I, i think he was one, one of the first mem- members of the first 
parliament if i remember yes. right they've been a, played a big role in education i think there are a lot of people who owe uh, the indians were a bit that way yes correct i i totally agree with you and also um one thing is that there within the anglican community i mean we have our own things i mean our own selections in terms of the educations we want to send the children to uh, you know influence and so many things and anglican homes are never the kind that tells a child hey if that person is not anglican you don't mingle with them I mean for me my my mom was very open about who I mingled with and she told me one thing she said see school is a place where you'll meet different people and mm-hmm. if you as an anglican child don't know how to separate between the good and bad you'll never learn that so that's one thing i really cherished mm-hmm. and loved about my family great and 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 tell me about your childhood uh, food memories or influences what Do you, do you feel that your food was different from what your friends would eat at home? Of course. Like so it's, it wasn't so much about bene dosa and all that. No way. <laughs> um, you know, I was one of those kids that had a sandwich for break time <laughs> and had a meat roast for lunch. <laughs> so it, it was, it was. you know i was one of those kids i was like hey my break time is at 10 o'clock and i have a chicken sandwich i'm going to finish the chicken sandwich and my lunch is at 11:30 and i'm going to short, have short break and long break yes <laughs> and and i was like hey i'm going to have uh, you know my grandma's kitchri and uh, uh, beef pepper fry and i was one of those kids that never liked to share my lunch box because food is <laughs> too delicious so um and also it was if if um, you were in the same school together i mean you sound like one of those kids whose lunch box i would like to share <laughs> but but i get the same thing like, i i mean i i know what you mean like um, you know on days when my lunch was nice yeah. uh, especially in college yeah. i would sometimes go i was in presidency college and we had this derosio um library from not wrong which is this you know centuries old and the books were centuries old okay. and you go in and it was very dark and all of that and there were all these corners where the people would take their books and study and i would find some corner and have my lunch over there <laughs> <laughs> i mean there are times i've hid my lunch box cuz i mean it's delicious you know my I grandmother friends are not watching <laughs> so so i'm just telling you that there was this uh, friend of us uh, sai drago uh, you know my she he was in advertising with my wife at one point mm-hmm. and and they were east indian if i remember right and and he's a very skinny guy you know? so uh, his mom would uh, you know fill his tiffin with these uh, potato sandwiches or beef or potato okay. chops and uh, you know uh, tang sandwiches and stuff and then he'd go to office and then my wife and there were a bunch of other of them and there's an office uh, not school or college <laughs> would uh, you know pile on him and empty his tiffin and every day he'd go home and then his mom would see that uh, you know the, the tiffin box is empty and the sun is not growing like even <laughs> one uh, gram more <laughs> Yes. I mean that's just the thing about uh, food you know because see um even today what happens when i go out and i have an egg sandwich or a chicken mayo sandwich i'm always taken back to what my grandmother used to make for me because it's those fond memories that take me back to that time when i was all about my lunch box waiting for <laughs> lunch break to eat grandma's sandwich mm, yes Yes, yes. Yeah. And when there was cheese or chicken, or you know, sometimes I go to Koshi's in uh, Bangalore when I'm there, and if I'm staying in town, yeah, and I just go there and in the morning and order the ham and cheese sandwich or and, and oh, the yes. Koshi special <laughs> coffee and a book, and and no one hurries you over I there know. or the meat omelet and uh, stuff. Yes. Hmm. So, um, uh, did you at any part start cooking when you were growing up, or, or when did Yeah, I started cooking when I was I think 14 years old. Okay. It all started with uh, me just volunteering to help my grandmother cut vegetables. Your dad's mom or uh, dad my grand my mom's my maternal mom. grandmother, yeah. Uh it all started with me helping my grandmother cut those vegetables and then slowly me telling her, "Hey, can I just fry them for you? I'll help you out while you're doing this." and it was then from the frying it went to can i add this into the pan and yeah. she was always scared because you know it's those grandmother instincts you're a girl if you stand here the the flame i'm scared if you'll get burnt 
so one day i still remember that day it was um you know in these convent schools uh because they have their own church and chapel and all of that they yeah, sell yeah, the yeah. remainder of the host which is the communion so we used to buy that for i think 20 rupees i don't really remember i picked and what it up and what is that what do you mean by remainder of communion i mean um the the communion is a, a piece of um, it's it's host that is i don't know how it's made though it's a very thin wafer okay 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 so, and so, so it's a it's a bake some sort of a something like uh, that sort of a, okay yeah and once the wafer i mean it's cut into circles and given at church during communion and the remainder my school used to sell it because we as common girls loved munching on that all the time <laughs> because it's way so it's, it's you know savory, savory right it's it's salty yeah, it's, it's a little salty and uh, apart from the salt you taste nothing because it's wafer so you know i used to save up my tuck money to pick up that all the time to munch <laughs> munch money, it i love just... that how <laughs> enlightened can you get <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know uh, the thing was one day i picked it up and um, i got into my school van and i was come back home and i was thinking what am i going to do with this let's let's think so i still remember i told my grandmother hey i need the chopping board with uh, one onion one tomato two green chilies and that's it and she said you're carrying the whole one onion two tomato yeah and one green onion, chili one onion two tomato green chili okay yeah so we are and... I'm getting the recipe also <laughs> <laughs> i don't know and... what you're making but i'm getting and she said you're carrying this leftover host with you what are you going to do you'll get a stomach pain i said no way i'm going to try this so i put everything in the pan and i put chili powder salt turmeric all of that fried it to a nice masala made it spicy tangy put uh, coriander leaves and i ended up adding the host and, and host I mean, is uh, sorry it's it's a potato thing you no, said wafer it's wafer i think it's made with rice flour or so it's or, flour flour yeah. some some flour okay some flour that in water it's uh, it's made into a stiff wafer consistency no, and okay. uh, these corn i'm just trying to imagine the, the, the thing. yeah so you added the uh, the host to the masala yes i added the host to the masala i gave it a good mix and in my mind i'm thinking you know when i put the host on my tongue it melts because of moisture so when i add this to the pan it's going to melt because of all that masala and it's going to catch the masala so that day i told my grandparents listen it's it's 4:30 we have something for tea so i served it and my grandmother was like wow this is delicious and then from there my culinary journey started because um it went from substituting that to bread and i made bread upma and then it went from me teaching my grandmother to make bread upma and that's how the journey started slowly and then i started watching my jala lawson gordon ramsay and it went crazy after that and any instance i would get i would make whatever possible slowly it went from vegetarian to egg from egg to chicken and then meat and everything else okay. like how you said chicken and then meat i mean even for bengalis parsis everything like chicken is vegetarian so i could connect with you two levels you know when i do these uh, interviews especially for people who are home chefs yeah they often say that at the age of 3 4 whatever they started cooking and and my mom had the same thing as your grandmom that you know like uh, children yeah. and and children was well into your teens children go into the kitchen because it's not safe and fine exactly <laughs> you mentioned nigella lawson so i must mention this uh, funny story so there was this time um, a few years back i used to go to this gym uh, in this locality which i would go to and stay banda and after work so it would be there for some years back at around 9 9:30 yeah so i have a snack in there and then go to the gym 9 9:30 at night so um, you know banda is a place with a lot of i mean apart from folks like me there's been supermodels and actors and stars so i would get on the treadmill and the treadmills would have um, tvs and i'd switch it on and 9 o'clock there would be a nigella show 9 or 9:30 i'm not too sure and and uh, you know she'd be making all the roasts and the things, i know <laughs> trifles and this and that and i'm watching and all that this is fine except i was surrounded by supermodels who were also cycling and those poor souls were uh, you know eating less food than you know people in a you know famine area 
and, and, and suddenly they were seeing <laughs> bachelor putting temptation all the way. I so know. later I realized <laughs> why I used to get those dirty uh, looks. Yeah. I mean, Nigella's food is, I mean, divine. <laughs> so, so Karen started uh, cooking, but uh, academically you then uh, went to journalism, right? Uh, from what I gather? Yes. And, 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 and where was this? Uh, what was the plan when you got into journalism? Uh, so it all happened uh, because I was somebody that was very interested in the arts. Even though my passion was cooking, I was very interested in the arts and psychology was my favorite subject. Oh, uh, my wife's as well. Yeah. Okay, as well. Even though I didn't do psychology in a pre-university, I was very intrigued to know, you know, things of within within the subject. So when I got out uh, of uh, pre-university, the first thing was, I'm going to take a combination that has psychology. And uh, I went and, yeah, uh, there was a combination that had journalism. And I was very interested in journalism, too, because I wanted to learn advertising and marketing and branding and, you know, all of that stuff. And that's how I went towards journalism, because journalism and psychology together two of my favorite subjects yes i'm taking it so cooking was a passion but you didn't really think of it as a profession at, at that point um you know the uh, thing was uh, yeah i was interested in going to culinary school um and i was interested in doing a culinary degree but the the thought of me having to actually you know finish the degree and then go back to working at a hotel kind of stopped me because I was scared of the environment and I always knew that I wanted to have my own business whether I did my culinary degree or not. And is that a common thing among Anglo-Indians because it's a very community thing like for example the Parsis or us Bengalis um, we generally tend to be more in uh, service it's, it's not so much an enterprise community, unlike say the Marwaris or Gujaratis. Uh, Anglo-Indians, um, Anglo-Indians I thought were more into service, right? As a community? Uh, as a community, versus yes. Versus business folks? Versus uh, business folks, I mean, they're more either professions like doctors and all that or with jobs. Uh, I think some of them are, are people who like to, uh, I mean, put out their skills and, you know, do something from home and, just make the most of it. But some of them are actually people who, who like to go to work and who like to be within the whole industry, different industries, right? But uh, community per se, I'm not quite sure of that because from my family, uh, generation-wise, we've had people in the Navy, people in the Army. Yeah. Uh, so it's a little different, I think, family-wise. Yes. And your exposure to the Anglo-Indian community was largely folks families from Bangalore or did you at all interact with people from say Calcutta or whatever? Um, I got to interact with people here and there from Calcutta. Uh, I mean, I got to know about people from Calcutta after I met my boyfriend uh, because he's also Anglo and his folks uh, father side are from Calcutta and I've heard a lot about Calcutta mm. from him. Oh yeah, but anyone who's from Calcutta, you'll hear a lot about Calcutta from them regardless of which community they're from. Yes, yes. But, but, but then you're a proud Bangalore loyalist as well. <laughs> yeah, Bangalore is Bangalore, <laughs> yes. So I've just heard a couple of things, never really interacted with anybody from Calcutta like that. I've heard about uh, Anglo-Indian culture in Calcutta from some of my customers who have ordered food from me, yes. Apart from that, not really. So great, so, so journalism happened, uh, journalism yes. school. Yes. And then uh, after that, what? Uh, it was still not House of Anglo, right? It was Where, still uh, not. So, so it, what were you doing? I believe you were in PR. After yes, that. I was. Um, after college, um, I didn't want to take a break because I'm not one of those people that likes to idle time. You know, I get bored quickly and I'd rather have something that's got my attention, my mind. I didn't know that was an option, taking a break <laughs> after college. We are you not know, Europeans. We are there, there are some people that say, hey, I finished college. I'm going to take a break for six months. I know people that way. <laughs> I was Maybe not one of <laughs> Maybe things are changing. Yes, I was not one of those. Um, I still remember telling my mom, my exams got over, my results were out. And um, I think 
two weeks after that i i sat for two weeks and i binge watched all the shows i wanted to watch which ones i think uh, it was breaking bad no, was... i'm i'm reading brian canston's uh, uh, autobiography almost finishing it now life in parts have you read it not really you get hold of it it's quite nice a life in parts by brian canston okay i i think i, I i'm a heavy yeah. reader too but i'm a more of a paul coelho fan okay. i love reading the that's very heavy that's very the, heavy this the is the alchemist was something that changed my life to be honest um and yeah i was i was watching movies and i was watching shows and finally two weeks were over and then i was like hey i watched everything i wanted to watch and not uh, just cooking stuff right i mean you were watching breaking bad this that yeah because yeah. i was i was um at home and in the afternoons i would cook mm-hmm. and then that was okay for me to to just get rid of that time you know get into the kitchen cook something yummy bake something do something it was like that and uh, then i also uh, had the evenings where i was wasting time watching the stuff and then two two weeks were done and then you know i remember my, my mom telling me she was like hey you just got out of college you went through that whole one year of stress and working hard and doing your best so just give it some time you know when it's ready to go out and look for a job huh. and then i knew mentally i wasn't uh, fully completely ready for a job uh, but i was ready to do an internship and um, i was one of those people that loved content writing so i got on to uh, one of the internship websites and i applied and to my joy the first internship i applied for i got selected <laughs> and <laughs> they called me and they said hey we're into we're a medical firm and we'd like you to do content writing for us and that's how the entire journey started i was with them for 6 months and then i quit cuz my mom said hey come to dubai and be with me for a while okay so i went there was there for 3 months came back and that's how my pr journey started and and pr uh, was uh, what uh i was a press release editor and okay. i was uh, i mean doing press releases and editing press releases for pretty big clients sports corporations like the nba hilton hotels facebook things like that so in a way then um, you were professionally uh, sort of learning and then listing how to market brands yes. and, uh, and you know yes that's something i loved about uh, my job that i was in my full time job because it taught me so much about branding so much about mm. marketing and how you present yourself as a brand and that's very important like whichever be the industry whether you're a writer whether you're a restaurant or chef or a, or a home chef in fact that's why i do these uh, branding classes with uh, home chefs and in fact the entire idea behind home chef is if you and and you entered for that and you know the yeah. entry process and you saw the jury jury was entirely people from the world of advertising and business and not food people specifically because we wanted people who knew what brand building was uh, all about and they could therefore choose and and obviously the fact that you were in the top 5 in your uh, category uh shows that uh, some of that learning must have come uh, off use so not tell yes. me uh, uh, the house of anglo uh, journey how did that happen when did that happen that happened i mean while i was still at my job and it was in the pandemic and uh, it all started from me uh, observing my surroundings so i was a person that loved going out a lot and every weekend i was out hardly ever spent time at home because if i was at home i was doing my night shift and uh, morning i was sleeping half the morning apart from going out for breakfast and coming back so it all started with the lockdown and i got very very aware of my family and what we were eating and i also was was stuck with that thing of saying hey i can't go out anymore i can't eat food so let me enjoy food that is at home i i can't eat outside food yeah i Because mean i can't eat food i i can't eat outside food. outside food so let me just enjoy food that my grandmother is making for me you know and then uh, i became very aware of the food that i was eating in terms of roasts and the non veg and the dal and so much of that 
And it was that moment of epiphany where I was like, hey, I've gone out so much, but I've never eaten typical Anglo food. Yes. So like I, I said, said, not even in Calcutta. Yeah. It's not there. It's, it's not really there. So I was like, let me do a research on what it's like in Bangalore. And uh, eventually the lockdown slowly started lifting. And I went out, I think, once or twice. And I looked at a menu card and I saw something that was very Anglo and I ordered it. So once it came on and I tasted it, I was like, nah, not really, not typical Anglo. So I went back home and I was like, okay, I'm going to do research. But, but is, is it a typical Anglo? Because you said that even within households, there would be differences. Uh, uh, I mean, that... typical Anglo in the sense, I'm talking about flavor wise. Mm. You know? No, I, I know what you mean, yes. Yeah. Like, for example, two Bengali households, the, the dish would be similar, but maybe the, the, the uh, you know, the fiery punch or the sweetness and all that might be different. I think uh, the Anglo cuisine is not, not really about um, the spice levels or anything. It's about that one flavor that every Anglo looks for, you know, and mostly it is about vinegar, and ginger garlic, less spice, soft, succulent meat. Mm. So it's a very different way. And the moment I taste it, if it's more Indianized, then I know, okay, this is not it. And, and what you're saying is right. If, if, if I take some of the dishes like the Vindalu or the Sopatel, um, yeah. I would say Vindalu, I've had a Calcutta Anglo Indian version. Oh, wow. And I've had the Goan, I've had the East Indian. Yeah. And they're all like gradations are different. The Sopotel yes. again, I've had it in the Mangalore Catholic. So it's, yeah. it's a bit, uh, but it's a bit funny, you know, that that's, if you look at the East Indian and Portuguese, uh, Goan community, yes, they are more Portuguese influenced. So the Anglo Indian, like you said, is British, some yes. Dutch, but still their commonality in, like, for example, the Vindalu is there everywhere. Yes. Even the Parsis have a cooked Vindalu. Uh, wow. But, uh, but that's probably because they had Goan cooks, a lot of Parsi households had Goan Catholic cooks, so that's how it came in. Yeah. yeah, but I also feel, you know, when I was doing my research for the Anglican cuisine, uh, I I very, um, I mean, I very seriously looked into where our spices came from and, you know, what really happened at that time. And that's when it struck me that there were, a, that there is a lot of Portuguese influence within the Anglican community as well. And that's how we get the Vindalu because mm. Portuguese cuisine had that and yeah. um, it moved on to Goa and then slowly it came to the Anglican community as well because of the trade of spices. So uh, the Anglicans also have a little bit of influence from the Portuguese side and then our British, of course. And, and just to understand, is there like any dominance of Catholic versus Protestant, uh, you know, in the, in the Anglican? Like you know, the Goans and East Indians are largely Catholic. Yeah. And in Calcutta, I think there was both, like there were both Protestants and uh, mm -hmm. there is any like dominance that way? Because mm -hmm. British would be Protestant, I'm guessing. I mean, again, the British has both their sides, you know, they have Catholic and Protestant and within the community, uh, I don't really think so. That so there's, yeah. 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 It's, mm. it's different because... I think we as a community, we are like, okay, you're Catholic, you believe what you believe, you're Protestant, you believe what you believe. And we're fine with both. Both sides are happy. And into sport also, right? And the Anglo Indians are like, yeah. you know, the Indian hockey team, football team, all of this in the original days, yes. Olympic runners and all would be a lot of uh, Anglo Indians. And, you know, since you're saying that, uh, sports, my grandfather was heavily into hockey. He loved oh. hockey. And uh, many people that I know who are Anglo Indians had their own thing with sports. My mom was also a runner, hockey player, basketball player, and all of that in school. So yes, sports, they, they were pretty dominant. <laughs> okay, now coming back to Household Anglo, which is more about eating than running. I'm yeah. just I'm to eat the food. <laughs> so, so then you tell me, how do you go about setting it? Yeah. And, so, and did any of your training in journalism or, or as in PR, did that come of use? Yes, it came of use because once I realized that I'm going to go ahead with the concept, you know, the thing of building a brand was very important for me because I knew I had a unique concept and my USP was USP was that I'm selling food and I'm giving people food that 
cannot be found outside dishes from my menu you you will not found find it outside you know so i said okay the same way i need to come up with a name that is traditional but not very traditional and i also want the name to stand out with my family and from where my roots began so the first thing was okay my family is anglo and the the foundation of my brand is going to be my kitchen from where my grandmother was serving me food so hence house of anglo so um and after that the the most important part was okay i have my name i have my food i've i've you know decided what i want to put on the menu how am i going to market it and and also uh, cooking scale right i mean that's a new thing for you i mean you cooked at home maybe for friends and family yes but like you know when you're cooking for customers it's a completely yeah. different uh, it's a com- experience yeah it's a completely different experience and also i think while you're cooking for customers there's so much that you actually look into in terms of you know the packaging the way you serve it the dishes the spice level so many things because each customer is different mm-hmm. and each of them have their own preferences and the way i did things was not very stressful for me but it was a new experience and i enjoyed it thoroughly so you were you were customizing it at that level like yes uh, and i'm i'm assuming that a large part of your customers would be non anglo because anglo yes. is not really like yes. a big number right i mean correct correct you can run a business this is the anglo indian sort of most of my customers were people who maybe heard of anglo food but never tried it because it wasn't very available and some of them were people who have tried it from friends or friends of friends and now i gave them the opportunity to actually order an anglo meal so uh, my thing in terms of branding was that you know i i wanted to look as a very cozy brand as a very comfort food brand but at the same time we have essences from home in it so i still remember my first uh, times foodie article i was trembling the day it came out uh, and mind you my times foodie article came 3 days after launch wow and then the orders must have poured in after that right <laughs> it was independence day and i featured on that page and i was stunned because it was 2 weeks before that i said oh my gosh i'm going to launch a brand and after that now i see myself on the paper and i'm like hey is this really happening <laughs> and i still remember my mom saying she said gear up this is just the beginning Wow. So I was excited and that's when uh, things started growing, you know. People started writing to me and saying, "Hey, you have Anglo food. I want to try it." And then I had people asking me about, you know, if if they knew my family and all of that stuff and the social media response grew. It was crazy. And yeah, yeah, that's mainly Instagram driven. Uh first was my Facebook page. and i never really had an instagram account because i wasn't prepared for that yet but after time spuri i was like okay it's time i start my instagram mm-hmm. and that's how my instagram started but then facebook was still dominant you know people were ordering through facebook and that's how my orders were coming in and slowly i think with all the publicity that came around with the media and all of that it moved on to instagram and you also have a you are one of the few people i've seen who um has a website as well and quite easy to navigate and uh, yes. very nicely presented i must thank you so uh, much say because i was doing a little bit of research uh, on yes. that uh, you also do spices uh, if i'm right yes yes so i where do people then uh, can make the stuff themselves I also do uh, spices in terms of uh, I I used to sell spice blends like the vindaloo masala and the steak dry rubs and all of that but uh, my brand is also that kind of brand that experiments you know I'd like to see what my customers like I like to see what the response is and yeah. uh, I give my 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 products that incubation period and within that incubation period if i notice that something is not selling i change the concept so a lot thought goes into it so yeah give me some example of something which might not have worked and why you think it didn't work 
so for me, what really didn't work was I think my spice rubs because at that time I was also selling marinated meat mm. per kg for people to have their barbecues. So what I noticed was that people were buying the pre-marinated meat and having their barbecues and the spice rub was really left out, you know. So instead of buying the meat and then using yeah. the spice rub, they were wanted the whole package. The whole package, yes. So then I slowly stopped the uh, spice rub and then I still had the marinated meat. So you didn't uh, get too fixated to it that, okay, I thought of this idea and I should not give up. So you, you sort of decide, okay, not like, really. sometimes people tend to do that. Like, you know, it's, it's hard to give up. I was very, something flu- which you think. yeah, I was correct. I was very, I was very fluent and fluid. You know, I went with the flow and I was like, what works works because as a brand, I need to push out what's working. So tell us about and what when works I, and then, and why do you think that works? Uh, <laughs> The, the things that worked firsthand was my signature pork chops. I think up till date, I've served 65 to 70 portions of it. Send it to Bombay. <laughs> <laughs> I had people who ordered on a Wednesday. And that time I was selling it per kg when I just started. Uh, and then I had people order it on a Friday. And then I had the same person on it on a Tuesday. <laughs> so <laughs> they'd be I, the favorite of the cartel <laughs> For me, the shocking thing, you know, uh, as a as a newly launched brand, two months in, was the fact that I had very well known people from uh, the arts industry actually order from me. It stunned me because I was like, "Hey, this is my reach." These are my customers and I'm like, wow. And these are people whom we didn't know before. I didn't know. So these are just... Uh, yeah. It, it was, I mean, authors and poets and people just saying, hey, I need to have your food. And if, mm-hmm. so, so there was a lot of writing fueled by the pork chops. Maybe they were writing yes. about angst or sorrow actually, or politics after that. But yes. By pork chops. I actually had one of my customers right i mean she ordered the pork chops from me and right after she tasted it i still remember that post she put out a post and said that it was the best pork chop pork chop she's ever had and it took her back to the times of you know places in calcutta where there were pretty angulian girls and you know all of that and i was like wow food is such an emotion <laughs> don't do that to me because like <laughs> it'll be some time before i can access your uh, pork chops so uh, what else what, what are the other hits yeah I'm, so, I'm hurrying you because we've got about uh, seven eight minutes and i want to wrap it yeah uh, so it was it was pork chops and then it was my pot roast and it was um my cutlets meatballs um and uh and I the think, meatball would also be the curry yeah the i started i i put out the meatball curry but then eventually i made it just meatballs and mash well, I, th- I think, uh, you know, once, uh, normally my wife and I, after we upload this, yeah. uh, a day or two later, we watch this uh, together. Yeah. Pretty sure that she's going to book a flight to Bangalore <laughs> after this. I mean, all of this sounds like cutlets, uh, uh, pot roast, yeah. uh, meatballs and stuff. So um, I, I saw on the side that um, you were operating as a cloud kitchen. So now is it cloud kitchen or out of home? Uh, did things change with the lockdown? It's... Or, uh, it's still um, at home, but uh, I hopefully will be out there as a dine-in sometime soon. So, so you, you plan that? Is that your next goal? To be at that some point is, a dining Yes. Yes. That is my it. biggest goal, yes. And, and, and you're in a place uh, of the city, Indranagar, close to Koramangla, the 100 feet, per meter, whatever, yes. kilometer yes. road. I mean, that's, where, that's really the restaurant hub of New Bangalore, in a sense, yes. right? I mean, after... Yes. Uh, MG Road and all that. I mean, yes. that's where all the experimentation and new stuff is. Yes. Uh, and, you know, to add to that, uh, to just make Anglo food well known, I'm coming out with my book. I'm releasing it next week. Oh, how lovely. And, <laughs> and what's it called? It's called uh, The Culinary Treasures of the Anglo Indian Cuisine. Wow. So I'm releasing that next week, and it has some of my most favorite recipes from it, just to get people to actually make it and try it as it is 
Yeah, maybe who knows? Maybe one of the O'Briens would do an entire quiz event based on your book, like at, at the Lawson Institute in Calcutta. <laughs> we do a launch over there. I mean, uh, I, I, yeah, those are goals. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure many goals will. Uh, uh, this is not. Uh, tell me. So for for people who are uh, watching, who are either in Bangalore or have folks in Bangalore whom they can sort of order for. So how do they? How how does your operation work? Is it like a daily menu, or do you have to sort of book in advance? Is it every day? How do they book um, with you? So um, yeah. So so I have menus that come out every other day. Hmm. And uh, sometimes I put a Monday menu on a Saturday because I'd like to give my folks time, you know, to so order. Because you want to confuse people and say, "Hey, yes. it's Monday when it's Saturday." Yes, and also it it's, it mainly depends on my ingredients because now I'm serving lobster and tiger prawns and things like that. You get that in Bangalore? Get, yes, get I get fantastic lobster. Really? I, mean, I know just, you get like, good meats in Bangalore, pork and beef and all that. But yes, but that seafood was. lobster, I just got lobster from the Andaman last week and I did a fantastic lobster bake. So lobster's on the menu and whenever I have lobster on the menu for a Sunday, the menu's out on Thursday. But when I have my usual meets, uh, it is every other day and they can always reach out to me on Instagram and DM me and I'm ready to serve yeah. them. House of Anglo is uh, where Karen is. And Karen, uh, one, uh, like one last uh, bite from you yes. in the sense that, um, you know, people who are looking at starting something completely new and during this period, uh, yes. what has been your uh, biggest uh, learning which uh, could be of uh, use to them? Um, my biggest thing to tell anybody starting anything new right now is, you know, if, if ever finances is your tight spot, don't let that stop you. Because you can always customize your business plan according to your pocket and it oh. is going to work. That's a very, very sane advice. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's lovely that you you can always uh, do something. You can always find a way out. Because, Kalyan, to be honest, my my venture started with a zero investment. Oh, yeah. And and it's doing so well. Or like this chat series. I mean, in a conventional day, and you're from uh, media, you would know. At right? conventional time, you would try to sell it to a, a channel who would, uh, or a production company. And then one would have to fly down to Bangalore. Yes. Then uh, meet you and shoot and all that. Now it's just a laptop, Zoom. Yes. And, uh, okay, you pay a bit more if you want a 40-minute plus account. Yes. <laughs> and that's about it. Well, uh, absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Karen Martin uh, of House of Anglo, currently based in Bangalore, but I'm sure her reach at some point will spread uh, much beyond. Uh, but till then, look up her site, House of Martin, uh, House of Anglo, which yes. is House of Martin also, <laughs> on, on Instagram and place lots of orders. And share this video so that lots of people can face lots of orders. <laughs> Thank care. you so Karen, much. And, and, and the next time I'm in Bangalore, I'm, I will, uh, uh, before booking the ticket, I'll book the menu. Definitely. Please do so, Kalyan. Take care. Bye. Yes, bye. bye.